so you get onto a session and, and Joe, Bob, and Billy Joe, <laughs> I'm just sorry, I'm being stereotypical here, but they might say, hey, you take the fills, like the steel player, you take the fills on verse one, piano player, take the fills on verse two. And any sensitive musician, if the vocalist is phrasing, happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, they're filling in the spaces, right? Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. Hello, rock stars. It's your host, Lid Shaw, and I created this show to introduce you to real world recording professionals to hear their stories and learn from their experiences so that you can take your records to the next level and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is Dave Tuff a Dove Award-winning producer, engineer, and songwriter based here in Nashville, Tennessee. He is also a music industry educator at Belmont University and an active voting member of the Recording Academy, the Grammy Awards. Dave has won the grand prize in the John Lennon Songwriting Contest twice in the Electronica category and in the Country category. That's cool. We're going to have to talk about that. (laughs) Combine those two, right? He has written and produced over 150 songs for major motion pictures and television, including Pretty Little Liars, Empire, Glee, Nashville, and CSI. Awesome. And rock stars, you may also really enjoy his television show called The Producer's Room with Dave Tuff, featuring interviews with music industry creators and studio tours. You can find the show on YouTube, and I will include links to all this, of course, in the show notes as well at recordingstudiorockstars.com. Please welcome Dave Tuff to Recording Studio Rockstars. Dave, are you ready to rock? Well, Lidge, since we're in Tennessee, I'm going to say I'm ready to rocky top. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Man. I thought you were going to say like you're ready to twang or something. Well, I wrote that song a few years ago. If it don't twang, it ain't my thing, but I never never was oh, successful. Shoot. Did you really? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> nice, man. Yeah, anyway, man. Who wrote so. uh, B-E-E-R-R-U-N, Beer Run? I don't know, Is that man. even a real song? I, I can't say that I've heard it down on Broadway, but <laughs> <laughs> but anyway. All right, cool, man. Well, I've introduced you, but tell us who you are in your own words. All right. Well, um, like you said, I've been here in Nashville for about 12 years, 2004 is when I moved here from LA, originally from Missouri. So I'll give you the the Cliff's Notes version of my life. Uh, Obviously grew up in a town called Springfield, Missouri, which is close to Branson. And um, it was a pretty good musical community. We had a lot of folks come out of there, um, a lot of good engineers like Pete Matthews, who works at Ardent, or Jake Simpson, who's a Star Search winner. Um, anyway, I, I but, work with the band Flick, who's from around the corner from there. I think. Oh, do you? Yeah. Okay. And, and of course, you know, Vance Powell spent some time yeah. there working with Lou and a lot of kind of interesting Ozarks lore. In fact, the uh, Grand Old Opry got started there and then they moved it over to Nashville. Wow. So. Wasn't there a band called the Skeletons? That yeah, was sort that was, of Lou, that was Lou Whitney's band. So, okay, yeah. Cool. Yeah, and wow. uh, he was kind of the the godfather of of recording there, and especially like indie rock and and recording in Springfield. But long story made short, it was a nice musical community. But I wanted to get the heck out of there. I'll take two steps back. I was first a saxophone player in elementary band, but then shortly transitioned to drums and all the stuff, heavy metal, Metallica, and you know all that kind of stuff later on. So I, I wanted to find the best school for jazz drums at the time. And I had attended some camps down in Denton, Texas, which was University of North Texas. Long story made short, auditioned there, got a scholarship, went down there to study drums and music. So I got my degree in music down in Texas. But what I kind of realized at the end of the game is I was looking up to all these guys like, you know, Steve Gadd and Jeff Picaro and and, and what I actually dug about it wasn't the actual drumming. I know that it takes a while to sift through all this in your brain as you're, as you're growing, especially when you're young. I really dug the creative process that those guys were bringing about in the studio, the parts that they were coming up with, the, the more the creativity as opposed to just sitting there playing doom, doom, bat, boom, 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 bat all the time, right? So, and by the way, at North Texas, I went to school with some amazing guys. Keith Carlock was there when I was there as a drum major. Rich Redmond, who's still real active here in Nashville, just amazing drummers all all the way around. So 
Anyway, long story made short, I graduate from there, get a job with Capitol Records. I meet a girl in a bar. She's like, Capitol Records is looking for a receptionist marketing person. Okay, cool. So I get a job for Capitol Records working in Dallas. And this is when we actually still had record stores. And so, you know, we supported those record stores. Yeah. It was a, it was a field office. And, um, and being they, a receptionist, of course, is a clear segue <laughs> from drumming. <laughs> exactly. You know, it's the music business. Well, I, I realized too that I didn't want to spend, you know, my whole life playing smoky jazz clubs for whatever it was paying back then probably still paying the same you know 50 bucks a night have you written that song smoky jazz clubs yet (laughs) i need to work on that man uh you know too many songs to write but uh we live in nashville so we can do it work for capital got a scholarship out to pepperdine because in my brain i was still imagining and i don't know why but i'd been reading all these magazines about the la studio scene in the late 70s early 80s like it was this creative community and you know all the guys still played together face to face basically everything Nashville is now I thought LA was then so I moved out there and uh, got an MBA and realized that LA was nothing like it used to be it was all these guys in their in their bedrooms in their apartments programming of course you know this was the heyday of the boy bands and stuff and this was mid to late 90s so and it was just like not the scene I was looking for at all but I kind of stuck it out and I was like I'm going to get what I'm going to get from living in LA. So I worked for Warner Chapel Publishing and I also was doing demos. So this is where the recording comes in. I was doing demos from a garage on Bundy Avenue, the infamous OJ Bundy street. And, um, and I was doing demos for songwriters. So at that point, after I'd worked for Warner Brothers, I got an opportunity to start teaching. And so I was one of the few guys that kind of had worked in the business, but also knew the recording side. So I started teaching out there at a school and then Long story made short, made my way to Nashville from LA because I wanted to buy a house. So <laughs> yeah. at least that's one of the reasons, you know. That's a real impetus for a lot of people moving <laughs> from New York or LA yeah. to Nashville is they're just sort of ready to actually own a home exactly. or start a family. Start or a family, one. all of all the above. And plus being from Missouri originally. And, you know, I mean, all of us had, the, I, at least I did, I had the stigma about Nashville, country music, country music. But so I actually had a friend that moved out here a year before I did in 2003. And he's like, man, it's, it's changing. So yeah. Um, and I got here and I realized he was right. So, <laughs> yeah. So, you are also a professor at, uh, at Belmont, Belmont, Belmont yeah. University. Yeah. Nice, man. Tell us about that experience. So, I kind of like my first teaching gig, I kind of just like literally fell into it because I was one of the few guys that, like I said, could teach music publishing, but also could teach Pro Tools. But um, I realized I kind of really loved encouraging others to be creators. And that's still my mission is, especially with the, whatever you want to call it, d- democratization of recording or um, whatever environment we're in now, everybody, everybody being able to produce a master or most people being able to, at least with the technology, have the capability of producing a master at home to really in- empower students and also just the general public to become creators. So, I, I, Dude, I can produce a master now in my little pinky. <laughs> Nothing more than the fingernail on my on my pinky. <laughs> you can. So, what are the other four fingers for? I don't know. Uh, you know, follow up albums. <laughs> um, so, can you start us off with an inspirational quote? Something to kind of get us get us psyched up and rolling. Sure, let's do it. So, this is actually going right to teaching the students. I mean, I think so. My quote is from the Upanishad. I think that's how you say it. Upanishads. You are what your deep driving desire is. As your desire, so is your will. As your will, so is your deed. As your deed, so is your destiny. Dude, that's so deep. You know, people keep bringing on these deep quotes onto the (laughs) podcast, and I'm a little overwhelmed. I don't even know where to go with it. But uh, so what is it? So... It's really kind of like you you are what you're what you're producing what is, your thoughts are what your, your thoughts, thoughts are. manifest in physicality and your physicality manifests in your destiny. So Nice, dude. Your destiny. When you said the Aponish, I was like, is that a new universal audio interface that we're talking about here? <laughs> I should so, call it that. So what does that mean to you? I mean, and what does that mean as an educator? Well, there's a lot of things that it could point to, but you know, you've, we've all heard the 10,000 hour rule from Malcolm Gladwell. Is that the author's name? I think I think he just yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was trying to remember the I last I remember one. if he sort of coined it or if he just sort of made it popular. Again. Codified it, yeah. So anyway, uh, but but just you will become what you are. I know that's so, I don't know, ambivalent, but if your passion is recording, then you will become 
a recordist, as Edison called them, recordists or sound men. So not engineers. They weren't engineers technically until right. EMI, I think. Well, I mean, they weren't so. <laughs> even designed to record music initially, right? right? They were right. supposed to just be for recording, you know, dictation in yeah. the office for That's, yeah, that stuffy was... businessmen with cigars. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, but whatever's in your heart, it will manifest itself. I guess that's really all I can say. So, I think it's a great quote because it reminds us that we have an incredible power to create and make things happen. Yes. Whether you're making music, whether you're just deciding to get together with somebody and do a podcast interview, whatever mm-hmm. it is. But there's still an element to that, though, that is, you know, maybe we can talk about sure. this the difference between it will just happen because it's in your heart or. You need to make it happen. So I guess that's the connection between um, as your will, so is your deed, kind of in the middle of the quote. So I'm trying to think. So if you want it to happen, you're going to do something about it. Exactly. So you have to have will, will to power. So you have to have will, not to allude to the Oscars last night, fight the power, but a will to power, <laughs> which I think they had a hit with Free Bird and some other song as a mashup, that band Will to Power. Do you uh-huh. remember them from the 80s? Anyway, never mind. Right on. Going off on a tangent. But I think that's the will uh, the will part of it. So. All right. Well, so let's talk about, uh, let's stick to teaching here for just a moment because, <laughs> okay. you know, our listeners, who I yeah. like to refer to as the rock stars, you know, they're... The the idea, the whole reason for us being here is to help them make better records, you know, awesome. and learn more. So what are some of the struggles that you find students having with learning to do this, learning to record, learning to make records, or maybe just like, you know, following their heart on this path? First of all, I know I sound like an old man, but there's so many distractions in our modern world. I mean, as far as I just remember, I think it can be applicable to an instrument because to me, the studio is an instrument. At least back a few years ago, I could just lock myself in a room and practice drums for eight hours if I wanted to. Now there's so many distractions, the cell phone. But once again, I think it comes back to your will. If that's your desire, you probably learn to to phase out all those distractions from the outside. So I would say number one is distractions. Number two, what I've noticed with my students, and maybe this is just my bias coming from a musical background, is if you're going to record music, you should understand music. <laughs> So a lot of people come in and just say, I'm going to be an engineer. And that's fine if you, you know, and there's nothing wrong with, you know, recording bird calls or, you know, being a broadcast engineer. But if you want to be a music engineer, you need to understand music. So, and you need to understand instruments. So I tell all my students, you know, even if you're not a bass player or even if you're not a vocalist, go take a semester of vocal lessons. So then you can learn how to communicate with a vocalist just you know, place it in your soft palate, place it in your hard palate, place it up front, place it, you know, just some of the the communication words. What does that mean? Place it in your soft palate and your hard palate? Well, the hard palate is the reflective part. I I think like more in the front, like by your teeth. Yeah. And to me, the soft palate is more like kind of at the top where your mouth is a little softer. So this was, this was hypothetical instructions to the singer as you're producing yes, yes. a vocal session? Right, right. Um, and just like, and some of the tricks you and I have probably learned as we went along, like one thing I always have uh, singers that play guitar live do is play air guitar because it helps their rhythm, right? Yeah. Or Because uh, they invented it that way. It's like, it's that <laughs> saying that says, you know... <laughs> What do they say like if you're gonna study for the test stoned, you should probably take the right. test stoned. <laughs> exactly. Hey, you know, I like. I'm not going to use that one in class, but. Uh, <laughs> anyway. But you know, with that idea that yeah. if somebody's learning how to sing a song right. with the body movement of playing the guitar, exactly. You know, they, they perform it better on the mic that way too. And some of those little tricks, they're not going to pick up just those first four years or without those ten thousand hours. But but some they will, and some we can communicate to them and. All of that. So I guess that's really my big, uh, my big complaint. If I had any or something, I push him to do is just understand music, learn how to read number charts, and I guess by default, that's what makes me kind of the production guy at Belmont. I mean, there's other guys that are you know more amazing than me, teaching how to repair a console or, or teaching some more of the advanced audio engineering stuff. But I'm I'm kind of the producer guy, yeah, on staff. So well, and another thing is just listening to music, right? right? I mean, listening it, to a know, lot. It's too bad that people don't have a simple tool where they can just call up any song at all on their computer. Oh, wait, they do. It's called Spotify. (laughs) But I mean, like, seriously, just sit around and study, study, study. And I mean, back when we were starting it, I mean, you you had to collect records and stuff. You know, maybe the benefit is you spent more time listening to the same records and you really got to know them. Oh, I agree. Uh, Maybe there's, once again, going back to the distractions too much. But I think another thing is... um, 
teaching how to not only critically listen, listen to the timbre. A lot of times, like today in class, we were mixing a song and they kept saying, oh, that's such an awful lyric. And I said, it's not our job as engineers. I mean, we could be part of the songwriting process, but this person is paying us good money. It's not our job to judge the lyrics. We're judging the, you know, the tonal, the temporal qualities of the recording. So... Anyway, but what was I saying? Yeah, but just listening, like I try to do exercises in my class by saying, just listen to the bass line through the whole song. That's all I want you to pay attention to. Or just listen to the kick drum through the entire song. And that's it. Yeah. You know. Well, talk a little bit about that too, because I experienced this when I started out and I got into this. I was motivated and passionate about the music that I liked. And when I first went to school, they had me listening to music that I didn't like. And I right. thought... I'll never like that. Oh, <laughs> that stuff sounds like crap. Right. And then a few years later, you asked me, and I might have a totally different perspective on it. Talk about that natural progression of of opening up your, you know, your um, palette of appreciation well, for different styles of music. It may be the first time they do it, but one of the exercises in my class, we we do a listening journal, and I say, you know, if you want to bring in reggae metal, bring it in because we're going to analyze it because. Once again, if you want to eat in this town, you're going to be working on other genres that you may not be a huge fan of to start with, but you learn, like you said, how to appreciate them. Like, you know, you may hate country music, but then you start listening to it and say, man, there's a lot of cool subtleties in here. You know, how they go from the one to the four and the steel slides up and just learn how to learn how to appreciate everything about the music. So I actually encourage them to bring in different types of musics. And then we do a, a journaling exercise on, on listening to these styles. So, you know, that's a start at least. Yeah, that's good. Um, now, what if you, can you just go to the next town to eat though, and then come back here to work again? <laughs> well, actually, you know, <laughs> that's what a lot of guys do. So. Hey, right. On. So, uh, all right. Now, can you share with us, you know, you've been doing this for a while, share with us a story about an important failure point for you, something where things kind of fell apart, but maybe it all worked out in the end. Yeah, I was thinking about that. Um, one thing is when I first got into Nashville, I worked, I was, you know, wasn't teaching full-time yet at Belmont. And I did a couple assisting gigs here and there with different demo studios in town. And one particular demo studio, I remember, I was, uh, I think it was recording a vocal. And it was an 1176, and, you know, a four to one ratio or whatever. And wherever the attack was, I think it was medium tack, medium release. But I was turning up the input knob and I turned the input knob like to two and maybe the output to, I don't know, 12 o'clock. Anyway, long story made short, the meter was slamming. Okay. So the studio owner that was going to hire me comes in and he's like, the meter slamming. And to me, it didn't really matter because it sounded good. But to him, it wasn't technically correct. So I don't know what the lesson is there. Sometimes you have to please the people that are just focused on the technical side. Um, but to me, I thought it sounded good. So it's all right. That guy's just washing dishes now <laughs> anyway, right? Exactly. And I was trying to think of another one too, a more m recent one. You know, we all struggle with Q systems, especially if it's not our own studio. But it took me a while to to jump into like a new studio and figure out how I was going to do Q mixes, especially with, the, I don't know if your listeners are familiar with it, but in Nashville, we have the more me's, right? So each each player can set their own mix, but it gets a little funky when you're doing overdubs, especially guitar overdubs. Cause if you have, you know, a stereo channel for guitars and then you do three more overdubs, do you put those on another fader or do you put them on the same faders? And so that kind of stuff, it took a while to kind of get used to as well. And I probably made some mistakes and made some musicians mad, but I think I'm, I'm closer. What is your feeling about the experience of musicians and the times when you've controlled the mix from the control room versus the times that they control their own mix. What advice do you have for us about Ooh, the benefits of either? Gosh, I've heard arguments to the both sides. So for instance, I'll just give you a recent example. I was going to record this um, church band and I, I won't name the church, but, and the guy said, a lot of our musicians are inexperienced. So they're going to want a studio with more me's and the studio I was working in had two Q mixes. And I'm just like, I'm going to get a nice Q mix and everybody will be happy. And he said that they couldn't function without more me's because they're all going to want to listen to more of themselves. But to me, that's like, the exact opposite of what it should be. They should be listening as an ensemble, especially as beginning players. So um, I don't know if that answered your question or no, not. No, I think but... that's right. I mean, when, as soon as you said they were beginner musicians yeah. and they all wanted more me mixes, you right. were already like throwing the wrong ingredients <laughs> together, yeah. right? Because I've found that it's um, the people that are usually more experienced yes. that know how to handle a more me mix. Agreed. And I am yeah. constantly, constantly reminded in the studio 
that Lidge, you dummy, why didn't you go out and put their headphones on sooner and find out what they were listening to to realize why it was screwed up? Right. Because you know, they'll, they'll have people who they just won't even know that they're listening to terrible sounding headphone mixes or that it's all distorted or that the knobs are out of whack. Right. And as engineers, we just got to go in there and check them. It's and, a and pain. Of, co- of course, you have to be at a certain level as an engineer too, or at least get your chops together. And that's why they say prep for the session, you know, boys and girls, but get a nice mix before they come in. So they have to trust you as well to get them a, a mix where you can hear everything. So. Yeah. That's a reminder also is I try and do that for vocalists before yeah. they ever step up to the mic. I try and put the headphones on, check it myself, check levels, make sure it's approximately right because, you know, you only get one shot at that first take, and if you and if you waste it with the wrong sound, yeah, yeah. you can't get it back. Someone was telling me the other day, and it's something I've never done, but you know, you learn. I think I actually gleaned it off a YouTube video to check the phase of the headphones with the vocal mic. I was like, I have never done that, but one one of these days I'll try it out. You would think, I guess you would just make sure your headphones are phase coherent overall, that they're pushing out when a kick drum hits. But Hmm. I thought, interesting. I never thought about that. Yeah. Where would you even flip the phase on the headphones? I guess you just flip it on the mic. Flip it on the mic and yeah. You're on the mic. Yeah. I don't know, man. (laughs) New, that, that's what I love about engineering too and music in general is like there's something to learn new every day and yeah somebody just comes in one day and goes blue <laughs> exactly. and you're like oh my yeah. gosh blue really I never even oh dude I can't wait for and I watched session. this video last night it was um, and I'm really obviously constantly trying to learn they used a decapitator on the master bus and I'm like whoa, I never thought about that either, but it sounded cool. You know? Well, I mean, I think the decapitator is just trying to be a console, right? <laughs> exactly. So, so a little harmonic distortion and yeah, why not? you're there. You know? cool. Maybe you don't distort the crap out of it. Right. But... It was just a like 5% mix of decapitator on the master bus. So like, Uh-oh, cool. watch out. Everybody's going to be setting 5% <laughs> now. All right. So Dave, now share with us a moment of success, some, something where things really worked out great for you. Success. Other I than like being invited to be on this podcast. <laughs> I think... One of my moments of success where I knew I not arrived, but I'm doing pretty well as an engineer was was where your old colleague uh, Efri Chippen said, "Those drums sound amazing. Don't change a thing. Next time, always record those drums the way you recorded them." I think I recorded them at Ocean Way, and it was like uh, just a couple of coals as overheads, and maybe a couple eighty sevens as overheads, M fifties as rooms, and. I was like, yeah, cool. If I get a good compliment from Reed, I'm I'm happy for the day. So, but anyway, that was that was just one example. Um, Did you ask him if you you could just randomly switch drummers on it? <laughs> that makes a difference too. Which, by the way, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw it to another tangent here. Is another question I ask my students, which I think is really important. I say it used to be a thousand dollars. Now it's two thousand dollars. But I say you have two thousand dollars to record um, an acoustic vocal. And you have to buy the acoustic guitar, you have to buy the microphone, and you have to buy, or you have to pay the player, okay? So those three things, what are you going to spend your money on in what order? And how would you answer that? I'm curious. Probably, let's see, $2,000. $2,000 would be a lot to pay a player for one session. It would. So that so, we know that in Nashville. That's even I'd above probably, union. Probably. <laughs> pr- and then what was it? It was it was Mike I was, it was, it was, I was going to say preamp, but no, it's a mic, guitar, and paying the actual player. It'd probably be like 500 on the mic, 500 on the guitar, and 1,000 for the player if I, I like could. That. Yeah. Yeah. So so that shows you where people are thinking priority-wise as far as I don't – that's another thing that – And by the young, way, could that be a rental budget? Because 500 <laughs> goes a long way for that mic. No, I mean, but it places priorities for students because they hear so many times, and we've all said this from the ads, you got to have this new – you know, it's the gas gear acquisition system. You got to have this new mic. It's going to change your recordings, da 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 but we all know it starts with the player. I mean, it's so obvious, but I think it needs to to be said again and again. So, and honestly, I'd probably save a thousand for the promotional <laughs> that, effort anyway. There you go, man. And that's yeah. Steve Jobs always said, "What if I have two dollars? I'll spend one on marketing and one on the product." So, you're a smart man. Lidge, so, so uh, thanks, <laughs> thanks, Dave. Appreciate it. You're a smart man too. <laughs> so, tell us something that you love the most about your job. You know what's funny is that. I was. I feel like I'm speaking in cliches, but they they say when you teach, you actually understand something. And and so if I'm talking about personal benefits, I mean not just seeing the smiles on the faces and seeing guys like we were just talking about Michael Hardesty and Stephen get out there and actually be successful. I know I had like a 
0.005% stake in that, you know, helping them improve as creators. But not just that of actually seeing the students, um, it's helped me grow as an engineer because I constantly have to reinforce the fundamentals over and over. I teach the introductory class and I actually like it because I have to keep reinforcing fundamentals and it reminds me every day that I can apply those to my own recording. I don't know. I mean, just link the sound waves, you know, to propagate a whatever it is, a 15 foot sound wave that's like 60 hertz. You got to have the space, you know, I mean, that kind of stuff. So those are awesome things. And when, and I, like, I'm constantly coming back to relearning things. I remember I yeah. found an article that explained to me how proximity effect happens. Uh-huh. Proximity <laughs> effect on a mic, on a, you know, a, a cardioid microphone. Yeah. yeah. And I was like, holy shit, that's so awesome. Yeah. You know? And I just love stuff like that. And, you know, when you start thinking about sound waves and the way they work and Mm -hmm. understanding how that affects room modes in a space, or just you start looking at frequency ranges that always seem to sound like crap in your home Mm -hmm. recordings or whatever, your small studio recordings until one day you realize, oh, that must just be the room modes of that, you know, space. And I'm just needing to cut a lot of that stuff. Yeah. Um, and then also you mentioned Michael Hardesty and Stephen Turney, and yeah. those are the guys from previous episode here on uh, the 24-Hour Records. Oh, I didn't records know you had guys. them on. Okay, yeah. cool. Yeah, we did nice. a 24-Hour Records episode. It was cool. All right, well, uh, let's see. Tell us what you're excited about right now. I'm always excited about stuff, Lidge. Let's see. You could talk a little bit about um, your TV show. Yeah, let's talk about that. So started a new TV show about a year ago. It's called The Producer's Room. It's on YouTube and Facebook and all that good stuff. The focus of the show is a little bit different in that, you know, like I I was telling you earlier, uh, there's so many good technical shows out there. We do talk technical a little bit, like what ratio you're going to use on a compressor, but it's more of an overarching thing, you know. So I'm interviewing a lot of producers, some songwriters. We're talking more about the creative process. Like, for instance, I might ask Dan Huff, or I did ask Dan Huff on one of the shows. I said, you know, what? tell me about pre-production. And so he tells me what his pre-production process is like. And then we also play recordings, which is pretty cool. Like, so for, I'm just, Dan was the one on the top of my head, but we played Rascal Flat tune, what hurts the most. Yeah. And we were listening through it and he was like, you know, Mutt taught me this and this guy taught me this. And you just really get to see their thought process. And that's what I dig. So it's more about the creative process. So that's, yeah, that's, we're doing what the 10th episode coming up and I'm going to have you on soon. So. Okay, cool, man. Yeah, man. Awesome. Well, it's a great show, and uh, I think it's really cool that you're doing it. I mean, it's really a labor of love for you initially. It is. It uh, is. We film it at the House of David, which has a whole nother history of of being the last studio built for Elvis, and it has this trap door from the garage so Elvis could avoid the press. And because David Briggs was Elvis's piano player before Tony Brown was, and so and you get to see all the connections in this town, which are so many. It's pretty cool. Wait, so let's keep talking about that story because it's a great one. I forgot all about that. Yeah. So if I understand right, Elvis would show up in his limo. They'd pull into the garage yes. underneath the studio, and then he'd come up through the trap door yes. into the studio. I'm sorry, I didn't clarify. And he, and he could leave that way, and then nobody yes, would ever see exactly. him coming or going with the Now, limo. it was built for him, but he died like a month before he was supposed to record there. So, I mean, I don't know the exact story. You have to talk to David, but but uh, which is unfortunate. But then they had a nice streak of stuff in the 90s, and then they're reopened again. So that studio, but it has a nice history. So. Yeah. What do you think the trap doors do to the sonics of a room? <laughs> how, how do you design that in? <laughs> that I do not know. Tell us a little bit, like what advice would you have for somebody who's learning to record now? You know, somebody who was going, should they be looking and considering school options? How does that compare to you know, DIY learning or online stuff. Well, the coolest thing, and once again, you're part of the movement here is this democratization of recording that I'm talking about is there's so many resources, both on YouTube, podcasts, what Pensado's doing, all of that stuff. And so the question begs itself, do I even need to go to school? If you talk to good old F. Reed, he'll say, just spend it on gear, right? And get started. (laughs) But uh, anyway... I guess what school gives you is the feedback because that's the one component you don't get from some educational shows as far as someone standing over your shoulder and give you feedback. So I like to think at Belmont, at least we're small enough class size that I can give all the kids immediate feedback on if they need to tweak something. So, you know, one of the things, cause I went to middle Tennessee yeah. state university uh, down the street, 45 yeah. minutes down the street from Belmont. And one of the takeaways I had was it was just being surrounded by the community of other people who were interested in what I, I was that's interested. that's the other thing. Because you, know, you come like, up as a peer group and you still probably communicate with a lot of the peers that you went to school with. Yeah. 
yeah, that's a whole nother thing. And you form relationships like at Belmont. One of the famous ones is Frank Rogers and Brad Paisley. And they were both, they met at Belmont and they, they kind of came up together. And it wasn't even so much that I knew people like yeah. F. Reed Ship and to ask yeah. him on the show. It was great. But, yeah. it, you know, that we honestly hadn't talked since school till then. Wow. That's crazy. So, you know, it wasn't so much that, but I think that while I was at school, you know, if I turned around to all my friends and I wanted to talk about something and geek out on it, they were all the ones that wanted to geek out on that too. You know, we'd sit around and yeah. debate microphones <laughs> and speakers and other things. Exactly. So in that respect, I really think that the community is killer. That's yeah. key. Yeah. All right. So then tell us a little bit more. You know, you got a ton of experience with writing for TV shows and things like that. Talk to us about your you know, music writing process sure. and how does it how's it different writing for TV shows than just writing you know, yeah, making up songs and starting a band on your own. <laughs> I want to do that too. No, um, well, let me let me take a step back because I want to say that I think there's a lot of different types of engineers, and you know, some are coming from more technical side. I'm definitely coming from the musical side, being a, a drummer and then bass player, and I play keyboards in a band, and you know, one of those guys that tries to play everything, jack of all trades, master of none, but engineering was only a function of composition for me. So I didn't start as an engineer, but I wanted my recordings to sound good. So I kind of had to force myself to learn engineering. I think a lot of folks are like that. And some people are vice versa. They, they learn the engineering and then they learn the musical side of it. But so as a compositional tool, just like, I guess, you know, Bach would have picked an organ back in the day and said, you know, I want you to tweak the pipes on this, or I don't even know how you tweak a pipes on an organ, but, you know, polish them up, or I want them made out of brass versus copper. It is a compositional tool. So now saying that, film is more, I would say, emotion-based, meaning the recording itself, the texture of the recording and the temporal quality, once again, of the recording has as much to do as why it sells than the lyrical content. So, for instance, it's the antithesis of Nashville. In Nashville, it's all about the lyric, I think. Well, I mean, the melody counts too, but but we're going to look at the floor and we're going to say, yeah, that's a red rug you got there, Lidge, with some you know purple flowers on it, and we're really going to describe everything about it in the lyric. In film TV, we leave it a little bit more ambiguous. We say, yes, that rug makes me feel... I don't know, delicious, you know, and you're like, what does that mean? It's more of like a John Lennon approach, right? Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, but it evokes an emotion, not only the lyric, but the texture of the song. So I guess that would be my two cents about writing for film and television. Interesting. That's great, man. I would not have anticipated that response. So that's very cool. Yeah. But the cool thing is, once again, the engineering comes in because it's textures. And the other thing, I mean, I don't want to sound like a, you know, <laughs> like if you're writing for TV or you, you're often trying to set a mood exactly. that supports a story. Yeah. So visual, it, right? the, the, the supervisors will tell you there's only two songs in, in film TV, which are the upbeat and happy and the really dark, slow and sad. Right. Um, there's some stuff in between there, but they're showing the continuum and, and the, the two different emo- the major emotions. The other thing about the lyrics is you don't want to step on anything in the scene, right? So, for instance, uh, you can't say a guy's driving them down the street in a red Cadillac because there might be a blue Honda in the... So you don't want to actually be that specific in the lyric content. Ah, that's fascinating, man. Yeah. That's really cool. We yeah. might have to do a whole episode just on that. <laughs> it's interesting, man. Um, so. You got any favorite lyrics off the top of your head that that have... That you've really enjoyed? Um, other artists or anything? There's anything oh at all? man, there's, there's a, a there's a, a I love, on you. I love, yeah, I know. I love Joni Mitchell stuff. I mean, she's so poetic um, and descriptive. So I couldn't probably use that for film and television. But gosh, I don't. <laughs> uh, that's right. Well, so I, I did notice also. I have that to read them, you know. <laughs> you produce and write in a variety of styles, and maybe this is more of the same question, but. What can you tell us about the good and bad of yeah. switching genres? Well, when you're, I'll definitely tell you the bad. Of music. And, uh, and, but once again, I'm just doing my heart's desire. So I love all different genres of music. And so I work on all genres of music. But I think the downfall of that, at least for your listeners, is that especially in a place like Nashville, people want to peg you like anything else, just like music. They want to put you in a box or at least maybe not put you in a box consciously, but you become known for something. So they say, well, if I have to do an indie rock uh, acoustic recording, I'm always going to go see Lidge. And he just is a tracking engineer, by the way. And, you know, obviously, by the way, he's not. So we, we all know that he's very, very diverse, but people, you start getting known for one thing. So that's bad. But the good part is once you get started known for that one thing, you work a lot, you know, because you become the guy for that. Um, 
I don't like that. I just, and so maybe that's why I acclimate or gravitate towards film and television because I can kind of do whatever genre it calls for and, and still make it work. So, so do you find it's easy to go from an electronica track to a country track to a, yeah. In fact, I find it fun because if I had to do the same thing over and over and over, it's just like, you know, cookie cutter, it's like cut and paste and I would not be a good boy band producer, you know? All right. So. I'm going to, I'm going <laughs> to surprise you with a couple of okay. questions here and then we'll go into the jam sure. session. For sure. the, uh, we'll take a break and go into the jam session. Nice. So uh, when you're recording electronic dance stuff, yeah. give us one useful tip that somebody who's doing that style ought to know about. What's a classic thing you have to address? Okay. So get a little bit more specific. I hate to, it goes back to your listening okay, so to music. So are we talking, beats, are we talking, got- uh, because there's so many genres and subgenres, there's EDM influenced pop now. There's straight EDM like Tiesto or or whatever that. I mean, well, what's which style did you work on more recently? <laughs> I'm just trying to think. The last thing I did was more like a pit bull dance. Well, you won like the a John. Pop. Oh, okay, yeah. Oh, ele- the electronic the John in there. Lennon electronic. Let's talk thing, about that yeah. song. Yeah. So that was a song my wife and I did. We have a band called Xavier and Ophelia. It's incredibly hard to spell, so just look up X and O music. But we have a band and we did that song. And that song was called Falling Down, and I'm trying to think of the impetus of that song. We wanted to do a hollow notes style chord progression to a dance beat. Okay, love hollow cool. notes, love their melodies, but I wanted to make it accessible and danceable. So that was the impetus for that song. So when I sit down to record it, I'm using references. So I'm saying, hey, I like the hi-hat pattern on this song, and I like the bass line here. I wanted to kind of make it sound like Sheik's Good Times meets this Jamiroquai song, but I want to do my own thing. So I'm constantly thinking about references in my head. So now as far as tonality, I can't really say there's any rules other than just listening to reference mixes. I mean, obviously in dance, you got to manage the low end. So just things like, you know, side chaining the bass to the kick, things like that. So you so you let the kick kind of be the dominant right. thing and push other things out of the way a little exactly. bit. Exactly. Yeah. I think a function of mixing, or really all mixing is, a lot of it is just arrangement. Just thinking about the whole song as a score, clearing out parts. Like if you think about a Quincy Jones big band arrangement, if the saxophones are playing something long, but the trumpets are going to play something short, but 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 so they don't step each on each other and mask each other. So a lot of good mixing is just good arranging. So right on, good tip, I don't know. man. I like <laughs> all right, cool. And then what about in the country genre? What what are some Good tips about, you know, you've country, you've got yeah. electric guitars, piano, right. acoustic guitars, pedal steel, yeah, fiddle, all in the middle, banjo, yeah. mandolin, all these instruments. How do you manage all that stuff? So so first, take a step back. First rule of country is lyric, right? The lyrics got to be heard. The lyrics got to cut through. So vocal intelligibility is A, number one. Everything else comes second. So making those things, once again, serve the vocal, not step on the vocal. Hopefully, if you have good session musicians, they're not playing over the vocal and you don't have to worry about that. As, what, is, what do you mean by playing over the vocal? So... You get onto a session and, and Joe Bob and Billy Joe, I'm just sorry, I'm being stereotypical here, but they might say, hey, you take verse one, the fills, like the steel player, you take the fills on verse one, piano player take the fills on verse two. So they're not filling. And any sensitive musician, if the vocalist is phrasing, happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, they're filling in the spaces, right? Right. So once again, it's a function of arrangement. And if that's not there as a mixer, you may need to clear it out yourself or at least automate it down and automate it up in those spaces. So that once again, to me, goes back to being a good producer because good producers are going to have ear candy every single part of the song. So there's not never going to be a space, well, unless you listen to bands like Segura Rose, but where it's just kind of... Or if there is but, space, it's very it's powerful and exactly. intentional, Exactly. Right? Yes. Powerful and intentional. Yes. So as far as mixing, man, I'm I'm not a full-time mix engineer, but obviously clearing out the low end, like I'm my first step I always tell all my students is filter, 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 except for bass and, and drums, you know. And then when you get in, into the others, just kind of making them cross-hatch together and finding little places in the spectrum that they'll work together. So, All right, so we're about to go into a break yeah. for the jam session. Last question, where's your favorite place to listen to music? Where do you enjoy Ooh. listening? I like, just, where do you just like, it's all just, just enjoyment? My favorite time is just driving. I think a lot of people do that. But, you know, driving to a gig, just, you know, like a four-hour drive, man, that's like, I'll just listen to like, you know, Pitchfork's Best for the Year or wherever. So I'm still really old school, by the way. I use CDs, believe it or not, but I'll burn stuff to CD and listen to it because I want them as WAV files. I don't want streaming, man. So yeah, I don't know. Well, it just so happens the CDs sound a little better than MP3s, <laughs> right? Well, I would say, you know, it's like an artist. If you were an artist looking at pixelated pictures your whole life and then you go to paint like the Mona Lisa, it's like... You know, you don't have a reference point, so. 
That's a good point. That's a good point. <laughs> so you're saying that by l- surrounding ourselves with MP3s all the time when we go into the studio to create, we're actually kind of spoiling our our internal mental reference. Yes. yes. That's cool. I haven't. I have, that's the first time I've heard that suggested. Yeah. All right. Cool. So, Dave, we're about to take a break, and then we'll go, come back for the jam session. Rockstars, I just want to remind you that I will have links to all the stuff Dave's talking about to the producer's room, and that's all going to be in the show notes at recordingstudiorockstars.com. It's also directly on your podcast player on your iPhone. If you're listening to it there, you can just pull that up so that you're seeing the, the logo, and if you touch on that, it just sort of dissolves and you see the show notes there, and so it makes it really easy to click through. See you guys in a second for the jam session. Hey everybody, it's Lid Shaw, and I want to thank you so much for listening to this episode of Recording Studio Rockstars. I really appreciate you, and I really appreciate your time. And as a way of saying thank you, I've created a special mix tutorial just for you, Rockstars, totally free, called the Mix Master Bundle. With it, you get over two hours of detailed videos watching over my shoulder as I mix a song in my studio. Plus, I give you the free ebook that explains how I recorded the tracks, and you get downloadable multi tracks so that you can practice your mixes, including the Pro Tools session file, using nothing but stock plugins in Pro Tools, all of which you would find in any other DAW, whether you're on Logic or Studio One or Reaper. Maybe you're struggling with trying to improve your mix technique, or maybe you just simply don't have access to multi track files or can't record a full drum set in your studio. I wanted to give you a chance to create your own mixes from full drum kit, bass, and guitars recorded in my studio. The song is called American Winter, and it's off my instrumental record, Skadoosh, and it's all available for you totally free right now. All you need to do to get it is text Mix Master Bundle to 33444, and I'll send it directly to your email. Again, that's Mix Master Bundle with no space to 33444. 444, or you can go directly to mixmasterbundle.com, enter your email, and I'll send all the files directly to you. Thanks so much, rock stars. We'll see you guys in the jam session. Cheers. Hey, rock stars, it's Lid Shaw, and we're here at Recording Studio Rock Stars with Dave Tuff. And he's joining us now. We're going to jump into the jam session. Dave, are you ready to jam? Jam on, baby. Jam on it. Jam <laughs> on it. When you got started out in recording, what was originally initially holding you back? Um, like I said, I started from a musical perspective. But when I first you know, said, I'm going to be an engineer, I think it was two things. First of all, I thought it was a science. I thought, man, this is science and I can do a calculation and I can get from point A to point B if I only do this one skin compression ratio and do that. And... The more you live, you realize it's more of an art. So that would be the first thing I would say. The second thing I would say is, once again, I had gear acquisition syndrome. So I would see, and it's like, only if I had a Neumann 87, could I make a good record, you know? And I realized after, you you always hear guys saying that, but I realized after a long time that you don't have to have that, so. Or you go back and listen to the records you did when you didn't have that stuff, and and you go, oh, that was really good. Yeah. What did I do back then? exactly. Before I started figuring this out? Yeah. So how about some of the best advice that you received? It's all about the song. Welcome to Nashville. (laughs) (laughs) It's all about the song. Well, really, I mean, it's all about the song and the arrangement and all of that. Another good experiment that I do with my students is I play them like a really solid song, guitar vocal, and a really bad song that's produced, (laughs) Britney Spears and stuff like that. But, (laughs) and I say, you know, which one would you rather listen to? And it really depends on their frame of mind, but they see that the production is not what it's all about, you know what I mean, to me. And so if you don't start with a good song, good arrangement, good players, you're not going to be too far in the engineering world. So, and I don't know, I mean, for your listeners, like you said, some are in Transylvania and some are in India. If they have that pool of musicians, I know we're spoiled in Nashville, but... Once again, there's this great thing called the internet, and you can actually hire people. I just saw you could hire, hire Kenny Ernoff uh, in his studio in L.A. You just send him, you know, 300 bucks and you record your drum track. So, um, you know, I guess you don't have to be in a community of, of a bunch of guys Well, anymore. and I mean, there are so many styles of music out there in the world. Yeah. We have one of our rock stars uh, is a woman who's engin- an engineer, and she sent in a recording to our Facebook group, and it was this amazing band incredible and it had it was like two bagpipes and a giant didgeridoo for bass and it sounded like like organic dubstep it was the coolest thing i've heard in a long time that's awesome 
But yeah, so I don't, I, the song may still be king over there, but I, I didn't understand the lyrics, so I couldn't tell you much about the song. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so share with us a a recording tip, hack, or secret sauce. Okay, so I'll get past the music part and actually focus on the uh, engineering, since it's an engineering show. So I guess I would say a really solid signal chain, once again, on the front end. You notice a common theme. I'm all about the pre-production in the front end and the writing. But good tones, good arrangement, once again, if I'm speaking to producing or just writing, I would say also uh, keep a Rolodex of musicians. What I typically like to do is if I go out and see a show – you know, even if I've had a couple beers, I still try to take a little note on my iPhone like, hey, this drummer's really good at rock. So I'm going to write his name down. I'm going to keep him on my list. So being able to cast players, and maybe I work in a lot of genres and maybe that's not what everyone has to do, but, you know, I would definitely have my cast for a rock record or my cast for a country record. So it's almost like being a... You're a filmmaker. Yeah, a filmmaker in that way. Yeah. Well, so now give us a good tip on keeping that stuff organized because I love the idea, but then sometimes, yeah. have you ever noticed that you go add somebody to your contact list and then two days later you think, who was that? Right. And so I, no contact list lets you see when the <laughs> I just do Excel. One. I do Excel. So I have a just, you know, name, email, phone, comments field, you know, social oh, that's security a good number. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, yeah. And you just put that right in on your phone or well, you add it later when I'll you get just, home? Yeah, I'll take that notes on the iPhone and then email that to myself. And I'm a little bit crazy about like archival. And I think we all are, especially as engineers, but like categorizing your favorite singles into genres, and stuff like that <laughs> on your iTunes. But, you know, I, oddly enough, the Excel suggestion is a really useful one because I think sometimes we get swept away by the possibilities of these pre-made technologies yeah, and, and apps and everything. To, yeah. And then next thing you know, it's so confusing. Yeah. Nothing ever happens. And spreadsheets are so useful. Yeah, Everything man. from just working out a budget sure. for a session that you want to do to keeping track of an organized list of names. And it's so much easier to go back in and find stuff that way. I mean, you have to update stuff. People change their emails and stuff, but you can, as long as you have that name, you can Google them and find them, you know? And the other thing I do is I scout people on YouTube. So I'm always looking for new voices. So if you're a new voice out there worldwide, send me some, some links to your stuff because I can't use the same singer all the time. So for film and television, so I need new voices. So awesome. Yeah. Take, take advantage of that <laughs> rock stars. Yeah. All right. So, uh, share with us, Dave, now a favorite hardware tool for the studio. So favorite hardware would be a good instrument. Once again, start with a good instrument. And then my signal chain of choice would be just something simple like a U87, like a solid state condenser mic that has a flat response so I can tweak it later. I can add high end or dip the high end and a nice tube preamp. So my one of choice is a UA610. And um, I, when I was in California, the very last year I was mentored or I got to work with, I don't know what you want to call it, Bruce Swedeen for about a month and a half. And he kind of just changed a lot about the way I viewed recording and his favorite go-to because Bill Putnam, he had literally worked on the original Bill Putnam consoles because he was right under Bill Putnam, uh, turned me on to the UA stuff and the UA just nice little big knob, 610 preamp. And, yeah, those uh, are great. Yeah. So it's funny because I think of a U87 as being kind of a big dark mic. And and it's probably not dark. It's just that it's not boosted in the high end. Right. Why it doesn't have enough it as being flat. As much top as a 67. So anything tube to me is you're going to get a little bit more high end. But yeah, if you look at the frequency response, it's like pretty flat. I mean, I don't know. I haven't measured mine lately, but um, it's pretty flat. So nice. you do whatever you want to. So it's like a blank slate in that way. Yeah. All right. So share with us now a favorite software tool in the studio. So, you know, it's just, I, you've probably seen it's not my nature, even though I call myself an engineer, not to get overly technical. But like, believe it or not, I actually dig these things that have come out like the CLA bundles or the the Mac the big knobs, not the Mackie big knob, that's another thing, but the waves big knobs. And, and everybody's like, oh, you have to just be a beginning engineer to use those. But you know what? I think one of the most important things as an engineer is to capture your initial gut reaction. And if I'm going through plugins and tweaking stuff for 30 minutes to get a bass sound, I lost my gut reaction. I yeah, lost no my initial left. impression. So with those types of tools, just the the general like CLAs, JJPs, um, the Waves bundles, that kind of stuff that have the little presets and their signal chains built in, I can capture 90% of what I'm hearing within three minutes. Then I might go back and do some tweaks. But to me, to capture that first impression would be the most important thing. 
other stuff I was thinking about, like a Waves Arvox, I use a lot. Of course, everyone uses the UA, UAD stuff, and they love it. Another tool I, I kind of changed my mixing was the Oxford bundle by Sonics, the Oxford Limiter on the Master Bus, yep. Oxford EQ, the Oxford the DS. Or, yeah, the Inflator, yeah. I found the Inflator and Limiter combo was See, my best that. mastering combo. Really? So yeah. which one? So the limiter's the I last one. I think I just one. put the inflator, yeah, the limiter last and the inflator before that. And you could mm. just, yeah. just kind of like blow, blow up your mix just a little bit. Yeah, man. It's pretty cool. <laughs> I mean, just that one little thing you just kind of enhance and... I mean, it's not that... I, I don't like things that are hard. I just don't like things that are hard. So, like, don't sell me a Brainworks thing where I have to, like, figure out, like, five bazillion knobs. That's just not me. Because, but once again, by the time I've done that, I've lost my initial impression. I kind of give this example to my songwriters that I teach in a couple of classes. I say, if you had to spend 30 minutes tuning your guitar before you actually sat down and recorded that song idea you had, you would lose that initial song idea, right? I mean, right. you would just... It, it's yeah. too much of the stuff up front and i think that's why these big mixers um like cla or whoever have their assistants set everything up for them they get all the templates all the colors all the patching so they don't have to worry about all that they just have to worry about being creative they sit down boom fader one is kick you know so getting rid of all of that stuff even when my i'm just trying to sketch an idea on my iphone and it bumps me out and i have to sign back in i get so frustrated yeah (laughs) it's technology man so do you hear that apple (laughs) All right, so now share with us a, a great resource for the business side of doing music. It, now, you, you know, this could be songwriting, this could be studio yeah. stuff and yeah. producing, whatever. Oh, I didn't talk about Outboard on that last question. Okay, well, another piece of gear I wanted to share with the, on this section is I've been pretty impressed with the Warm Audio stuff, believe it or not, like the mm-hmm. Warm Audio 1176. I know you have a nice 1176 sitting right there in your rack, but... Um, it for for five hundred bucks, man, it's pretty nice. You um, know, uh, Bobby Osinski, when he was on the podcast, he was using a warm audio. In fact, he just used it for our webinar as well. But he has the SM7. Yeah. I think it is going through. I don't remember what the pre yeah. was, but into the warm audio compressor. Yeah. And it sounds killer. I mean, it's clean. It's it's discreet. I mean, it's not going to give you the probably the grit that some of the older ones. Have are you taken give. it and just maxed it? out? I have not. Time, so yeah. I've been kind of using it. Yeah. <laughs> I've been pussyfooting around, so I need to work on that. Well, you can always get a little more distortion out of your plugins. If you got <laughs> exactly, it, right? just decapitator, man. Like right. I said, um, but 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 anyway, going back to your question, um, business. So, um, you know, we were talking marketing plans and all that, and that's good to know and and doing your taxes and all that. But to me, it, it you've all heard that it's a relationship business. But even more, I think the problem with engineers, and I see this with my students, is they only want to hang with engineers. So, like, if I'm going to go out to a mixer. Um, I'll go to the AES mixer, I'll go to the Vintage King mixer and just hang out with a bunch of engineers. But that's totally the opposite of what you need to do if you're actually trying to start a business. You need to go hang out with the people that need you. So like here in Nashville, you need to go to NSAI where all the songwriters hang out and they don't have any technical chops. And those are the people you need to hang with because then it's like a synergy. It's a win-win. They can use what you do, you can use what they do or their money, either way. And that's the way it is. So that's good. So basically what you're saying is is as recording studio rock stars, the podcast, we just need to partner up with a great songwriting exactly. podcast. Exactly. And Make mix and mingle. Yes, yes. That's yes. good advice, man. I like that. <laughs> I like that. I feel myself to be an aspiring songwriter. I'm always just trying to learn more and more about right. songwriting. I'll have to come over and listen to you more often. <laughs> All right. So now here's the hypothetical one. And this is imagine yourself in a new new land far away and you, you uh, need to have a simple setup for recording. You got to find people to record and you got to make ends meet so that you can eat and, you know, live and breathe while you get started. What would you start with? How would you find people and how would you make ends meet? Gosh, it's more than what I was thinking about. So I would probably just, first of all, go out to some of the clubs and meet some of the musicians and pick their brains. I mean, just to get an idea of the scene first and who the players are. But after that, as far as an actual setup, like I said, I said 87 earlier, maybe a stereo pair of 87s, because when I worked with Swedeen, he was like totally adamant about everything in stereo, maybe not the lead vocal. but That went by pretty quickly. Who'd you work oh, with? Oh, Bruce Swedeen. I was talking about Michael Jackson's engineer and just really a famous engineer because he came 
up during the 50s, worked under Bill Putnam, and then I got to work under him only a month and a half. But man, like I said, it changed my changed my life just, hey, just working with him. Rockstars, do you know a record called Thriller by any chance? <laughs> what is it, like 80 million, 100 million copies? I don't know. But he even did the early stuff. And then he did like he did a lot of Count Basie, he did a lot of Oscar Peterson, so a lot of jazz too back in Chicago. Anyway, long story made short, um, he, one of his big you know, 10 commandments is always mic and stereo. And if you listen to the Michael Jackson stuff, um, you can see that everything has a nice stereo image. So maybe two 87s, like I said, that's my mic of choice, but the tubes won't give out on me. That's fascinating. So it's mic and stereo. So what if you want something panned to the left or right? Um, Still mic and stereo, but, but have it the stereo mic yeah. position that way. Yeah. 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 Just, uh, well, it goes back to the binaural aspect and once again, I told you I teach the basics every day. We have two ears, right? God gave us two ears, or we evolved with two ears, or whatever you want to say. We have two ears for a reason. We have two speakers for a reason. It only took them, what, 80 years of recording to figure out, hey, maybe two speakers would be better than one. But so then why are we miking everything in mono? It doesn't give us a point source. So I'm not talking about kick drum, or, but I'm just talking about the things like you would stand in front of naturally, like a string quartet, and you would hear different things in each ear. So just taking the binaural perspective there. And so maybe two, two U87s, two UA610s, or LA610s, which have the LA2A, and maybe like some Apogee converters and a laptop. I don't know. Yeah, nice. What about making ends meet? Did you address that one too? How, do you, how are you going to survive meet. when you're getting started? <laughs> For those that are that need to eat and yeah, and pay no, I mean I don't think there's overhead. anything bad about getting a, a day gig. One thing I, I heard about, I heard from a songwriter once, is the best piece of advice she ever got was to get a job, a night job, so that you can use all your fruitful energy. I know this sounds awful to the employer, but you can all use all your fruitful energy during the day, that really intense energy for your craft. And then when you're kind of sleepy, you go to work, you know? But I mean, I think it's an, like, that's why, you know, you see a lot of musicians waiting tables. I'm sure walking around gives them some energy, but in general, use just that chunk where you're really invigorated for your craft as opposed to working all day nine to five then coming home and just tired and you just want to sit on the couch and yeah. watch tv you know um what about sessions i mean we're, here we are in nashville nashville sort of sessions can be uh, fairly bankers hours around here yeah. do you find that's still true across the board or you know how does it compare to other parts of the world and, and when recording sessions happen well yeah I mean, if you're on the the first of all we I wish we had more masters in nashville but just like we have less and less masters. So most of it's demo studio. So like in the demo studio world, it's 10 to one, two to five, and then maybe a six to nine. But you'll notice that it, that includes the lunch break and dinner break, important for musicians. So, and then on masters, it could just go all day. They could just like try to get one song out of an entire day if you got that budget. But what was the original question? You asked me about the sessions and how they, yeah, like how no, to I get into the sessions. It. Well, I think you answered it, which was yeah. just simply that, you know, the sessions are starting at 10 in the morning. Yeah, and they're going till about nine at night. There's yeah, three different sessions. And the old guys will tell you they also did a ten to one, and then they'd wake up the next day. But I don't, you know, we don't do that as much. I don't wow. know what it is, but there's more work back then, you know. Yeah, and so, they got a lot of songs recorded in that time too. Yeah, right? so I think I mean that even points that whole thing points to the whole model. And you probably asked a lot of guests about this, but the model that we live in, I just think you got to think outside the box and you got to think entrepreneurially nowadays more than ever because it's like I don't care if you're a musician, you're an engineer, you're a producer, you're a songwriter, you got to think, okay, we know people need food, so they're going to buy that. We know people need somewhere to live, so they're going to pay rent or buy a house. They know they probably need transportation. Why do they need music in their lives? I think it comes back to a fundamental question of why do people need music in their lives? And you got to be able to answer that. And once you can answer that, you can make a living off of it. So like for instance, People need music for weddings. Oh, guess what? I'm in two cover bands. Do I love playing covers? No, but that's where people need music. So that's where I am now, you know, and it's a good, it's a good side out of the five or six or seven different pies that I delve out of. And that's a whole nother thing is you got to wear a lot of hats. Your income streams aren't going to come from one thing. I have an income stream from teaching. I have an income stream from the film TV, from producing, from engineering, from writing, all that teaching or teaching an instrument. So just, I guess my thing is use whatever skills you can, whether it's that day job or whatever to, to make, make your living. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, that was a, that was another preachy thing. <laughs> no, it was good, man. It's yeah. good stuff. You yeah. got, uh, you've got all kinds of great insights for teaching. I love it. So uh, here's the big wop doozy <laughs> of a final question here. Yeah. 
What's the single most important thing that our listeners should do to become a rock star of the recording studio themselves? It almost, it's funny because we've come full circle in, in our Zen circle here. It comes back to that uh, quote that I first mentioned. So I would say, find what your deep driving desire is. And really what it goes to is find your unique voice. I think that's so important. And it may take you not 10,000 hours, like 30 or 40 or 50,000 hours to find your unique voice. But if you think about all the great Let's take artists, because we call them artists for a reason. We don't call them demo singers, because demo singers all sound the same. We call them artists. Think of all the great artists. I'll, I'll go instrumentally. My, you know, Miles Davis, Jaco Pastoris, um, engineers, you know, Bruce Swedeen, or, or whoever. They all have a unique voice. George Massenburg. They all have a unique voice in their genre. So on the flip side, always try to work with artists that have a unique voice. Because what I always tell my students is, Okay, maybe you need to get your chops up as far as recording and you'll just record whoever. But when you can start becoming selective, don't record that guy that sounds like John Mayer because there's already a John Mayer. And the label doesn't need him. Society doesn't need him. You need to find someone with a unique voice that's number one saying something unique lyrically but also sounds different. And that's where you're going to have your best chance at success. Yeah. I've also noticed that the people that succeed the most, it's the same thing you just said, yeah. is they always seem to be different and right. just true to themselves. And I think it may take, I mean, it does take probably a longer path uh, because you don't sound like everybody else and you probably get more rejection. But in the end, it's what's going to make you the most successful. So, And ironically, you talk about it 10,000 hours, maybe being 30,000 hours. Yeah. You know, Picasso, I think, said it took him a lifetime to learn how to paint like a child. <laughs> You know, and the idea yeah. is like, you know, you start out, you actually begin with that voice. You yes. got it right now. Just stick to it, get to know it, you know, 30,000 right. hours later, bam. Yep. You're yep. at the top. <laughs> exactly. I mean, I think in that book, they talk about the Beatles playing the Cavern Club, literally what we were just saying, like 12 to 14 hours a day for like eight years. People yeah. don't realize that before yeah. they even, you know, got on Ed Sullivan. So that is pretty amazing. All right, dude. Well, thanks so much for being here on Recording Studio Rockstars. It's been awesome talking to you. Let our listeners know how they can find you, learn more about you. Well, first of all, thank you, Lidge. And this is an awesome studio. So I encourage anyone that's in Nashville to contact Lidge and come see his studio. And they can find me at davetuff.com is just the easiest. My last name is literally like T-O-U-G-H is the real thing. And I've always felt like I should do like a co-write with Jeffrey Steele, you know, this tough steel combination, but that hasn't happened yet. But anyway, but yeah, davetuff.com or Facebook or check out the producer's room and you can just, you can just YouTube search producer's room and check out some of those episodes as well. Cool, man. Awesome, dude. Again, thanks for being here. And I, I look forward to watching more producer's room and I, I look forward to joining you over there. Cool, man. Um, I'll have you soon. Rock on, dude. We'll see you around the studio. See you, man. Cheers. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, please leave a rating and review on iTunes to help reach more people. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to recordingstudiorockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And if you want more free content, all you have to do is text RS Rockstars to 33444. Again, that's RS Rockstars to 33444, and I'll keep you in the loop with articles, videos, and podcast updates. And I'll let you know about any upcoming giveaway offers, all totally free. Thanks for listening. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is Recording Studio Rockstars. Now, go make great music. Music.